Good morning. Welcome to church this morning. If you're able, would you stand with us as we begin our service by singing and worshiping our God. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. As I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe. So when I fight, so when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be here with all of you this morning, and thank you for joining us online as well. My name is Jamie. I'm one of the youth pastors here, and today our service is going to be about an hour long. We're going to continue to worship together after these announcements, and then we are going to have Pastor Rita come up and continue our series working through the book of Colossians. Then we're going to close off our service by doing communion together. 
And every week when we do communion, we have our prayer team up at front here. These are people who deeply love the Lord and love our church. And if you would like prayer at the end of the service, they would love to be those people who can intercede on your behalf or pray for you or care for you in that way. So don't hesitate. If you would like prayer, come on down after the service and they'll be here waiting for you. Now, just at, on Friday, actually, uh, we had the grade 12 graduation at SEA. SEA came over here. We had about 1,200 people in this room celebrating the grade 12 grads. Now, are there any grade 12 grads in here from SEA particularly? They're all, they're all gone. They're all gone. Well, I want to actually give them a round of applause because it's, it's a big thing to graduate from our school, which is our ministry. And these, uh, every moment that happens at the school, whether it's a conversation or uh, a caring moment from the teacher to the student or they get to learn about Jesus, all of those moments are made possible because of the generosity of our church. Every single moment in this building is made possible because of the generosity of our church. From kids' ministry, where they're learning about Christ, all the way to seniors' ministry, where they're caring for each other and learning more about Jesus, that is all made possible because of you, church. And if you want to support those moments of ministry, you can do that by giving at spac.ca or you can give at the kiosks in the lobby. Now, when you give, it also provides for moments like pizza with the pastor. So we did, last night we did pizza with the pastor and we do this a couple, uh, once a month, every couple months. Um, and this is an opportunity for you to be able to meet the pastor and see um, how you can fit into the congregation, what the church has for you, and we will have one of these coming up probably in another month. So look forward to pizza with the pastor. Now, one thing I love that our church does is we partner with something, a uh, ministry called We Care. Now, We Care goes out every Sunday morning. They're getting ready right now, and they go downtown, and they serve the community of people downtown by putting on a service. They do worship together together. And they meet just basic needs by providing food and, and daily household items. And we are doing a We Care food drive. Now, this We Care food drive um, is we're collecting non-perishable food items. So canned foods, I don't want to see any rotisserie chickens or any, any buns. We want canned foods, non-perishable items, and we want to fill their cabinet full. So what we do with youth is when we're doing a food drive, we tell the students, go home, steal all of the food from your parents' cabinet and just bring it to youth. But I don't have to tell you to do that because you actually own that food. So you just bring, bring the food. We would love to see that cabinet get full so we can meet people's needs in that way. Now lastly, if, you're, if your child is up in kids' ministry right now and they come down later and they say, there was a fire. We had a fire. They didn't actually have a fire. They're just doing a fire drill. So because they're going to be doing a fire drill, I'm going to give you a little little uh, idea of what it would look like if we had a fire drill or a fire and how we would proceed to react to that. So we have sections in this room. This is section number one over here. Section one, section two, section three, section four, and section five. Then we got our balcony people. I won't forget about the people up there. Now the first thing to remember is you want to remain calm as always. And also you're going to think about your kids immediately. But you need to trust that your kids are safe, they have procedures, and your kids will meet you outside. So section one, you're actually going to exit through that side of the building if there's a fire alarm. Section two, three, four, and balcony, you go out the south atrium doors. And section five, you sneak out those doors, and there's an exit right out there. There's muster points on the screen here, outside, and then you can go and you can uh, collect collect your children, I guess, after, um, once you're outside. So that's what it would look like if we had a fire drill. Now that's all I have for announcements for today. Um, so we're going to get back into worshiping together. But why don't you join with me in prayer as we come before God. Father, we thank you that you love us so deeply. You love each and every one here, even those who don't know you, those who are working through doubts, those who um, are certain of their faith, those who have been following you for the entirety of their lives. Lord, you love us so much and you have plans for us. You have good plans, a hope, and a future for each and every person in here, Lord. And I pray that you would show us your love this morning, that you would, that you would meet us where we are at. And Lord, we just pray that uh, you would speak through Pastor Rita, you would speak through the worship, Lord, and we could just draw close to you. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. If you're able, would you stand as we continue to sing and worship our God?
blessed assurance Jesus is mine He's been my fourth man in the fire time after time born of his spirit washed in his blood and what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough I trust in God my Savior
have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back.
up our voices. This is why we sing. This is why we worship you. We come before you uh, to stand in gratitude and thankfulness for all that you've done, uh, that you took us, weak, broken, mistake-ridden uh, people, and you made us whole. You washed that all away. You said, I'm going to take that onto my own shoulders, take it to the cross, and give you freedom, give you new life, give you forgiveness, give you grace, give you strength, give you my power. So we thank you for that. We bless your name. We worship you for you are worthy of our praise. All of God's people said, amen. Thank you, church, for singing with us. You can have a seat. Kids in the room, grades three to six, thanks for being with us here this morning. You can head upstairs and enjoy the rest of your service together. Let me add my welcome this morning. It's so good to be with you. Just one community life announcement uh, before we dive into the message this morning. This coming Sunday is going to be our congregational budget meeting, and we're looking forward to that time together as the Board of Elders will present the proposed budget for the upcoming ministry year. And we just want you to know that everyone is invited to be part of that meeting. Okay, have you ever joined a conversation where you kind of were a bit taken back? Where, where you kind of think, if, if what I just heard is what they really meant, I'm, I'm not sure I want to be part of this conversation, and I'm not sure what to do with this. And then someone looks at you and says, oh hey, just a minute here, I got to catch you up on some things that you missed. You're going to need some context. And you're like, phew, our passage today is like that. We always say around here, context, when we're looking at the scripture, is really important. Today, it's extra important. And I'm going to take extra time on setting it up. All right, we're in week four of our six-week series on the book of Colossians, and the theme of this book we've established is the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus. We've just been singing about that together. He is the ruler. He's the ruler of the universe, and in this talk today, we are going to focus on authority. We're going to talk about this thing of power, and we're talking about two kingdoms, and these kingdoms are run by very different power sources, and they have very different rules. Last week, Graham brought us an amazing message where he talked about these two kingdoms in terms of the upper and the lower story. The upper story is the realm in which Jesus is king, where he has the final say. The lower story is the one in the scriptural narrative that we first learn about in the book of Genesis. And there we see the humans created in the image of God, and they heard a lie. See, the lower story, in that story, lies are the bread and butter. They're the bread and butter of that story. So these humans, they heard a lie, and the lie was that they would be better off without God, that they didn't need him telling them what to do, that they could make up their own rules, they could define good and evil on their own, 
They could be their own source. They could be self-sufficient. They did not need God. And they chose to listen to that lie. And so God, who is love, and love always honors the choice of the other, God, I believe, with a tear in his eye, ushered them out of the garden, gave them what they wanted, allowed them to go and to seek life on their own terms without him. That part of the biblical narrative is often referred to as the fall, and it begins the story of that lower story. But God, God, we see all through Scripture, was never willing to leave it there. He was never willing to just let his family go. In fact, immediately we're told in Scripture, right there in Genesis 3, that God had a plan. He had a plan for how he was going to win his rebellious kids back. He wanted them back, and he had a powerful rescue plan but not the kind of power that is part of the lower story. Not the power that uses coercion and lies and deception and violence and oppression to get the job done. Instead, one was coming who would expose the deep deception of the lie that we were better off without God. One was coming who would provide the way back to life with God and who would give us a completely new take on power. Colossians 1.13, we've already talked about in this series several times, and it states it this way, for he, Jesus, has rescued us from the dominion, from the power, from the authority of darkness, and has brought us into the kingdom of the Son that he loves. In our passage today, the author Paul is going to explain to these Christians, these young new believers in Colossae, how the kingdom where Jesus is Lord changes everything, changes absolutely everything, right down to our most fundamental, most important, and often most challenging relationships. He's going to talk to wives and husbands. He's going to talk to children and parents. He's going to talk to slaves and masters. You might say, why those groups? Well, these were the key building blocks of the society that the people he's talking to lived in. The Roman household was a highly authoritarian institution. In it, the patriarch held the power of life and death over his wife, his children, and his slaves. They didn't generally have any rights before the law, and they were seen as property. This is lower story stuff. And here's something before we go any farther that's super important, super important for us to understand. Paul isn't going to paint a picture of an ideal Christian home. That's not what he's doing. What he is doing is challenging new Christians living in a specific time and a specific culture to allow their newfound faith in Jesus, their new allegiance to him as king, to transform their way of being within that reality, the reality of how Roman households and society worked. So before we make any application at all to us, we actually need to try to hear this passage the way they would have, because otherwise it can definitely be misapplied. And it has been at times in history to great harm. So let's listen as they would have heard it. Okay, we're going to Colossians 3, verses 18 to 4, verse 1. If you have a paper Bible or a device, you can look up Colossians 3. We're going to have the verses on the screen behind us as well. It starts like this. 
Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. So, although today there's a lot of energy and controversy around the first phrase, it would not have been that way in the first century at all. In fact, this was the normal family structure. It's the second phrase that would have been kind of the like mind-blowing thing to the women that were listening. Um, this is where there was something brand new and transformational. Listen again. Wives, submit yourself to your husband as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. See, Paul is reminding these women that in spite of the earthly kingdom where they may be seen as property and less than fully human, in Christ, all of that has changed. Paul is saying to them, remember, you have been adopted into the family of God where you are now daughters of the king. You have great dignity. You have great agency. You have great worth. You're not a second-class citizen in this kingdom. You fully belong. This is really, really good news for the people hearing it. And because of that, because you fully belong, you know what? Just like Jesus did, you don't have to live a life kind of grasping for power. You don't, have to, you don't have to live that way. You can look at your husband and you can say, how can I be like Jesus and serve what you need? I don't need to meet my own needs. I don't need you to meet all my own needs. I've got another source. I've got another source, and it's sufficient. And you could look at him and say, how can I humbly just cooperate to help this household like be as peaceful and harmonious as, as possible? All right, there's good news in that verse. Let's move on to the next one. The next verse in this power, in the power structure that they were part of would have been completely revolutionary. It would have been completely unexpected. Husbands, love your wives. Never treat them harshly. Here again, Paul is saying to these new Christian men, these husbands, in this lower story, you have a lot of power. But remember, you are now under the authority of Jesus. The, rule has, the rules have changed. It's so much different than the power that you are used to. Jesus' power is the power of self-sacrificing love. The power you have, husband, is to be used for good. Not authority over your wife, but authority to call forth everything in her that God created her to be as you see her as your equal, someone made in the image of God and of infinite worth. See, the rules of Jesus' kingdom, they turn everything upside down. He's saying to these men, women are not objects and your wife is not your property to fulfill your needs. And because you also have been adopted into the family of God, your affirmation comes from Jesus. And here it is. You don't need to continue struggling on that endless hamster wheel trying to prove that you have value, that you are successful, that you have status. No, receive it from Jesus. And he says to you, this is my beloved brother, and God says to you, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Receive that affirmation. And as you continue to absorb God's love for you, you'll find, you'll find your true humanity, and you'll find your true manhood in a life dedicated to serving others, especially your wife. 
I want to tell you a, a really simple, uh, but I think profound little example. So this is the story of someone um, who had an incredibly traumatic childhood, but decided very early that they wanted Jesus to be Lord, that they wanted to live in the upper story. They wanted to know him as the one who is supreme and sufficient. This is my dad. My dad's greatest desire was to serve others because he loved Jesus and because he still does. Here's one little example recently. So back in December, my mom's health at, at 90 took a real nosedive, and we all became um, just very aware that it just wasn't feasible for them to continue living in their own home. Things were really falling apart. And so my brother and I and them together made the decision it was time to move into a senior's, uh, a senior's um, home. And so I'll never forget one day Amid the chaos of the boxes, uh, you know, trips to emergency, um, there's my parents at this t moment, just both sitting there in their chairs. Um, my mom is literally just kind of at that point hanging on to life by a thread. And my dad looks at her, and this is what he says. He says, you know what? Maybe this move, maybe this move will mean that I can help you the way I want to. Because you know what, lately with so much going on, I haven't even had time to rub your feet. So see, this is why that's significant. Uh, my mom has neuropathy in her feet and they get very painful and they go numb. And for the last at least 20 years, my dad, most nights, has made it his priority to take some time and to simply serve my mom by rubbing her feet because it helps them feel better and be better. I had the privilege of seeing a man who, though not perfectly, made it his goal to live a life of service. My parents would want you to know that their, uh, their marriage was by no means um, a little ut utopia. Not at all. They'd want you to know that actually what became the theme verse for their relationship is Ephesians 4.32, which says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. And they would tell you there's been lots of need for forgiveness within their marriage. All right, let's, let's move on in the text. Paul's next instruction is to kids, and this is what he says, okay? Let's get our heads back into, we're thinking about how this would have been received back, back into Colossae in that time. All right, kids, it goes like this. Children, always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. Again, there would have been no surprise with this, but the motivation, the motivation given in that verse for the obedience would have been really surprising. So the motivation is not like fear. The motivation is that that Christian young person now can say, I will willingly submit out of my fear for Jesus, out of my respect for the rules of his kingdom. So the motivation has changed. The shocker actually for the listeners would have actually come in the next verse because they would have expected that if there was any instruction to the, to the dads, it would have been, yeah, and you dads, you keep those kids in line. But that's not at all what it says. Listen to what verse 21 says. Fathers, do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. Paul is instructing dads to train their kids in a respectful way that gives them hope. He's saying, use the power that you have to come alongside and encourage your kids to flourish the best that you can, just like Jesus does for all of us in our stories. All right, for this last segment that we need to, to look at together this morning, I gotta pause once more and I gotta make sure we're gonna all be on the same page here. We gotta remember again, 
Paul is in no way painting a picture of what should be. He is talking to the reality of life at this time in history, and a huge reality was slavery. In fact, in many urban centers at this time in history, up to 30% of the population were slaves. This is lower story stuff. This is horrific, but this is reality. All right, to just get a little bit better understanding, a New Testament scholar and historian N.T. Wright has some things that I think are gonna be really helpful for us. He says, slavery was an undebated part of the social structure, the welfare system, and the economic activity of the ancient world. In the absence of a modern democracy and libertarian ethic, it would have been impossible to lodge an effective and successful revolution against slavery. The most effective means of helping slaves was through just and kind treatment, seeking to give them their freedom while keeping them within the safety and patronage of the household. So here, Paul is gonna address slaves who have decided to believe that Jesus is supreme and sufficient in their story, to live in that upper story. And this is what Paul says to them, starting at verse 22. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you, Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward, and that the master you are serving is Christ. But if you do wrong, you'll be paid back for the wrong you've done, for God has no favorites. Masters, masters, be just and fair to your slaves. Remember, you also have a master in heaven. There's so much in this. We see again, we see again the call to each one, the one with a lot of power, and the one with little to no power, both being called on to remember, to remember their ultimate master and to live in a way that would please him. There's a story in scripture that's so helpful on us with this. And uh, we, there was a sermon on this just mm, within, within the last uh, six weeks, probably. It was a sermon on the book of Philemon. This is the story of a slave owner who becomes a Christian and of one of his slaves who had run away and who also became a Christian. It's the story of how both these men are called to radical transformation because they follow Jesus. And this story shows that the good news of Jesus and what he has done for all of us provides a path of potential reconciliation for these men where they can meet on level ground as brothers in Christ, where they can come together with no one powering up, both humbly serving. You can go back and listen to that great message if you want. It's a stunningly beautiful picture of the power of the gospel to transform. Well, that's, that's our passage for today. That's, that's it. And I love the way the Bible product the Bible Project summarizes this, this passage that we've just walked through. This is how they summarize it. Paul is walking a very fine line here. He takes the most basic Roman institution 
and reshapes it around Jesus, who rules with self-giving love. While he does not abolish household structure outright, the exalted Messiah demands that it be transformed almost beyond the point of recognition for any Roman living in Colossae. And if you follow the history, look into what happened in that time in history, Christians, because of the authority of Jesus and how they wanted to live within the world, they were seen as a threat to the structure of the lower story. Okay, before we wrap up and go to communion, I just want to quickly clarify two other just small things, just in case, uh, just in case I- anyone may go there. Um, the call to be like Jesus, the call to be servants, is never a call to be a doormat. That's, n- that's, not, that's not a takeaway here at all. I hope you've heard the dignity, the worth, the value that Jesus places on every life. There's no call here for anyone to be a doormat. Jesus' call to all of us is to love others the way we love ourselves. We are to steward our own lives. We are to care for our health and well-being, even so that we are able to extend that and care and love others. We're gonna always need to put on our own oxygen mask first before we can help others. All right, one other dangerous extreme. We addressed this extensively in the last message of the Trust Series when we talked about the need at times to protect ourselves in very definitive ways from destructive people. And something we can be incredibly thankful for is that in our day and in our society, we have more structures in place and more laws to help that happen. All right. So for today, for us, in this century, in this society, it's important that we recognize that the story of the two kingdoms is still it is still the deepest struggle in the universe. And if this morning you acknowledge Jesus as Lord, as supreme, as sufficient, here's a couple of questions that I hope will be maybe just good takeaways uh, for us, for us this morning. Firstly, I think it's good. It's really good and really important for all of us to stop and reflect, how do, you re- how do you view other human beings? Every other human being. Your kids, other people of significance in your circle, other people in society, other people around the globe. Like, how, how do you view them? Do you view each of them as made in the image of God with infinite worth, completely your equal. Another good question for us to always be thinking about is, how do you view the nature and the proper use of power? Unhealthy, destructive, lower story power asks, how can I use people for my good? How can I use people with the power that I have for my good? To get what I want and what I think I need. Healthy, life-giving, godly power It asks, how can I use whatever power I have, whatever power I have, for the good of others and for God's glory? How can I use whatever power I have, whether it's in 
my home environment, social settings, um, uh, in my work environment, uh, on vacation, wherever I am. How can I use whatever power I have to serve others for their good and God's glory? All right, we're gonna move now to communion. And uh, if you've gathered with us online, uh, make sure you have juice and crackers if you'd like to participate. And anyone that's a follower of Jesus is so welcome to participate in this celebration uh, with us. If, if you're someone investigating faith, we are so grateful that you're with us and we don't want you to feel any pressure that you have to participate. Um, might be a great time for you to be able to actually just think about these two power sources, these two kingdoms. I want to read just one more passage for you because it really sets up communion well with what we've just talked about. It's from Mark 10, verses 42 to 45. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and actually they have been arguing about this whole thing of power and position because they don't quite get it uh, yet, what Jesus is talking about. This is, this is Mark 10, 42 to 45. Jesus called them, the disciples, together and said, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone. For even the Son of Man, that's Jesus, came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. The servers can come and to take your places. And in just a minute, I'm going to invite you to come and receive the bread and cup. It's all in one little uh, container. There is no place, there is no place that we see more clearly the correct use of power than in what Jesus did for us on the cross where he willingly, he willingly laid down his life in his ultimate act of service to us. So the way we're going to walk through this communion together is that after you've received the elements, we're going to hold them, and then we're going to sing together a song. And it's a song that's going to be really familiar to, I think, most of you. The song is actually the testimony of someone named John Newton, who lived way back in 17-something. And John Newton's life was absolutely transformed when he encountered Jesus Christ. And this song is his testimony, and his story is partly that when he encountered Jesus and it changed everything, he went from being a slave trader to completely stopping that and being someone who defended, who defended the value and the dignity of every single human being. And so as we sing this song together, let's remember the power of Jesus to change individuals, to change families, to change societies, to be the kind of place where we all want to be, because that is what Jesus does when he invades our lives. All right, come, come please, and come and receive the cup, and uh, then wait, and we'll... We'll sing together, and then we'll take the elements. There's stations both here at the front and at the back. You can go to whatever is closest to you in this time.
singing these words. Amazing grace, how sweet the It's all the grace of Jesus. His grace to me, his grace to you, his ability to transform our lives. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he said to those gathered with him, he said, this is my body, and it is broken. It is given for you. Eat it in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup. He took the cup and he said, this cup, this cup is the new covenant, the new promise in my blood. See, he's promising this thing that we can find life in him and we can give that life away to others. Let's drink together, being incredibly grateful for what Jesus has done. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful as your people. We are so grateful as your church family for the incredible gift of life that you've given us, that you were not content to let us continue going our own way with no option of coming back to you. Thank you for providing that way. We love you. Would you continue to show us individually <clears throat> and as a church family how to bring that life and that love to the world around you. Thank you. We pray in the strong and beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
As uh, Jamie mentioned, if you're here this morning and you would like someone to pray with you, there's people that would love to do that this morning. Please don't miss the opportunity. I can't promise anything else. I can promise this though. I know that when you come and you simply tell them what you would like prayer for, you will know, you will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are profoundly loved by them and by God. All right, church family, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you. The Lord turn his countenance towards you and give you his peace. Amen.